It's always incredible uh, what they do, what Danny and his team does, because it just, that just excited me about what we're going to talk about. <laughs> That's the message. God's still the same. Wow. Well, uh, grateful to be here today. I'm thankful to be up here and have the opportunity to share with you what God's shown me this week. It's been a big week for me. It's, this is just, um, this is one of those times where I'm just excited to share with you something from God's word because it's real. It's real to me. He's done a work and I pray that he will in your heart too. Pastor Chris and Jody are away this weekend. They're down in New Orleans doing a marriage enrichment weekend. So I'm thankful that God's using them in another state to see homes transformed by the gospel of Jesus. And so they're down there doing that. So we miss him today, and, um, but thankful at the same time that God's using them. And, um, and even today that he has a chance to uh, to recuperate a little bit and, and just be away. So next week he's fired up and ready to go back here at Inglewood. So um, go ahead and turn to Matthew 6, just while I'm kind of introducing stuff, just so you're ready. Um, there's, a, there's a condition in the, in the church among believers. There's a, there's a struggle in the heart of believers known as worry known as anxiety. And the reason it's a struggle and the reason, one of the biggest reasons I think it's a problem in the church is because it's one of the things we would consider to be a respectable sin. In other words, it's one of the, it's one of the things that we do that we tend to kind of brush over as okay, as normal. We dress it up and even even tend to take pride in how worried we are about things. And so this week, earlier this week, I had a passage chosen and I was ready to go. I was starting the study process and getting ready to preach on Sunday. And then about halfway through the week, it was clear that there was something different that I needed to go to today. And God, God just showed me and, uh, Matthew 6 has been something that he's been working through with me, and it's something that I've had, to, I've had to continually remind myself, and here's what I thought. I, I think most likely everybody in the room on Sunday morning has struggled or is struggling with worry. If you're like most people in the world, this morning you're worried this morning you're anxious and Jesus speaks to that and gives us great hope and what I'm about to tell you depending on the situation you're in but what I'm about to tell you may seem impossible you can lay aside the weight of worry believer you can lay aside the weight of worry. We're going to be in Matthew 6 today, starting in verse 25. So if you would, grab your Bible and let's stand together if you're able to as we read God's word together. Matthew 6, starting in verse 25. Here's what it says. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you'll drink nor about your body. What you'll put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his lifespan? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field how they grow, neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, 
saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning and we ask, speak to our hearts. Lord, would you make your word clear to us? I pray that as we hear and understand the scriptures, that this truth would travel from our minds to our hearts and into our actions in everyday life. Lord, I pray today you would set people free from the weight of worry. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, go ahead and grab a seat. And if you have the the Inglewood app on your phone, open that up and go to the notes section. If you're you're a note taker, great. If you're not a note taker, be one today. I plead with you, be one today. Um, If you don't have the app and you don't have a pen and those kinds of things, you can also text the word notes to the number that's gonna pop up on the screen there and then you'll get a link to the notes and you can fill them in and all that. And all the scripture will be there too. So you can follow along and we're gonna go through a a good bit of scripture kind of fast today. So I think that'll be helpful for you as you go through, it helps me. Um, So I wanna start off by telling you um, Beware the ways of worry. Most of the great battles of the Christian faith take place in the mind. Worry and anxiety is no different. It's a battle that takes place in the mind. And Jesus gives us a command right off the bat in this passage, Matthew 6. He says, do not be anxious about your life. And the way he says this, if you, uh, if you pay attention in English class when you were in school, um, the, the grammar that he uses here is not a one-time command or just a one-time thought. This is a constant and continuous action that he's telling us to make. And so this is not, uh, worry and anxiety has no off switch I know you've probably read this passage before. If if you've been in church a while, you've probably heard this before and you know that Jesus says, do not be anxious, but you may have asked the same question I've asked before. Yeah, but where's the off switch? How do I just turn that off? There's some things that we struggle with in the Christian life that we can just put away, right? And we can get rid of a device or we can take a step to turn it off right now. It might be hard, drastic steps, but we could turn them off. This one is one that you can't walk out the doors today and have hit your off button and never come across this again. This is a constant and continual battle for the Christian. This command to do not be anxious about your life is something that you will constantly battle, but you can today lay aside the weight of worry. Today, you can say yes to obeying this command of Jesus and commit to walking forward in life through the worries and through the anxieties of life in obedience to him. That's what we're gonna talk about. That's what we're gonna see in God's word, how we can be free from this and how we can obey this command of Jesus to be free from anxiety. Where do we worry? So he says, don't be anxious, but what do we need to avoid being anxious about? What do we need to avoid being worried about? I wanna look at verse 25 again with you. Let's look down at verse 25. He says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you'll eat or what you'll drink, nor about your body, nor what you'll put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? What do we worry about? Everything. (laughs) That's what Jesus is telling us. He says, don't worry about your life. 
behind every door, there's a worry. Every stage of life reveals new problems and new concerns for us. Now he's gonna give us a list of things that we tend to worry about. And you may be dealing with one of these today. This isn't an exhaustive list, but it's a good list. But we worry in all of life. If we do, it will paralyze us. It will hurt us and it will rob us of joy. It'll rob us of peace. It'll rob us of sleep. It'll rob you of a strong home. Worry is paralyzing. There's a reason Jesus points it out so clearly to his disciples here in the Sermon on the Mount. Here's the first one. He says, don't worry about money. I want to back up for a second. Matthew 5, verses 19 to 21. This is kind of where the list starts. He comes off of this subject of money and he realizes that the disciples he's talking to, uh, well, there are a whole series of things they worry about, but let's start with money. Verse 19 says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus says our money, our finances, our treasures of this world should not be our top priority. For many people, our money is our top priority. He's clear, his word's clear, that our treasure as believers can never be a treasure on the earth. Our treasure as believers always must be treasures in heaven. What are treasures in heaven? Treasures in heaven are things that last longer than money. Treasures in heaven are things that last beyond life on earth. Treasures in heaven last for eternity. Treasures in heaven are things like your heart's condition. How are you growing in Christ? Are you immersed in his word? Are you involved in his church? Are you active in worship? Are you active in evangelism? Treasures in heaven include the people who you'll take with you. The people to whom you share the good news of Jesus. The only thing we take to heaven are the people that we bring with us. Treasures in heaven. Moving the focus from our money and our earthly stuff and our earthly treasures to the things that we get to keep forever and ever. The things that matter most. Don't be anxious about money. Focus on the things of eternity. That's what he's telling us. Second, he says, don't be anxious about food. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Jesus is great at this. When he teaches, he gives illustrations. Sometimes we look at illustrations from, uh, from Jesus' teaching and we think, well, that's kind of random that he went to that. Um, but he, he is really good at this. He looks at his disciples and he says, look at the birds. What do we know about birds? So here, here's a little personal thing for me. Uh, birds get up before me, usually. And uh, the first, one of the first thoughts I'll have in the morning, like when spring comes and they're really loud outside the window, we have these old windows in our house and we can hear everything outside. So uh, we'll hear these birds. And my first thought when, I, when they wake me up is how annoying that is. I just want to go let the dog outside so I can go back to sleep. Um, they, they're up for a reason though. 
the early bird gets the worm, right? So they're out, they're, they're eating, they're taking care of business, they're doing their stuff that they need to do. And we've got, there's a, there's a window outside of our, uh, our kitchen, right above our kitchen sink, where there's a bush out there, a tree. I don't know which, it's a big bush, a little tree. But there's a cardinal that lives there and he's there every year he comes back and he builds a new nest. And it's a big deal in our house because we have kids and it's kind of fun to watch the process. He builds that nest in like a day. He builds his whole house in a day. It's little, but he's little. So it's a lot of work. So they're industrious little creatures. And then we like to watch the, eventually there'll be eggs in the nest and we can see it and stuff from our, so we lift our kids up there and it's kind of neat. They're really interesting animals, but one thing that they never can do, they never sow seed. They never plant crops. They never make worms. They don't cook. They don't, their food is ready for them. They wake up in the morning and it's provided for them. Uh, This is what Jesus is telling us, but think deeper about what he's showing us in this verse. Look at verse 26 again, where he says, and yet whose heavenly father feeds them? Not their heavenly father. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, your heavenly father feeds the birds. That puts this in a little bit different perspective. If your heavenly father will feed the birds, surely won't he feed his children? We're, we're created in God's image. He, he asks, are we, more, are we more value than the birds? Of course, the answer is yes. We, we're created in God's image. Then we're recreated because of the gospel message, because of the cross and the empty tomb, we're recreated. We are of infinite value to our heavenly father. He will take care of the birds and he will take care of you. If you're in him, he will take care of you. And there's always a question that comes up here at this passage. There's always the question of, well, what about hunger? What about starvation? What about these things? We're going to get to those things. Shouldn't we worry then? We're going to get to those things. But I want us to look at 1 Corinthians 6, um, verse 19 together. It says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You are infinitely valuable to your heavenly Father. If he feeds the birds, he will feed you. Then he talks about our health. It says, don't be anxious about your health. Verse 27 says, and which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his lifespan? I know this is, uh, I know we know this. Brothers and sisters, I know we know this. But we act in our worry and our anxiety as if we don't know it. We don't believe it. But we can't add a year to our life. We can't add a month to our life. We can't add a moment to our lifespan. We can't because we are not sovereign. We're not in control. God is in control. And aren't you glad he's in control, by the way, and that we're not in control? He's sovereign. That's why we don't have to worry about our lifespan because He knows about it. It's in his hands. It's in his plan. Let's look at a few verses together. You won't have time to turn to these. So look on the screen or look on the notes app. They're right there for you. But here's some verses that speak to this sovereignty and this plan of our lifespan. Deuteronomy 32, verse 39. See now that I alone am he. There is no God but me. I bring death and I give life. I wound and I heal. No one can rescue anyone from my power. Job 14 verse 5 says, Since a person's days are determined and the number of his months depends on you, and since you have set limits, he cannot pass. 1 Samuel 2 6, The Lord brings death and gives life. 
He sends some down to Sheol and raises others up. Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 to 2. There is an occasion for everything and at a time and a time for every activity under heaven. A time to give birth and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. Psalm 139, verse 16 says, Your eyes saw me when I was formless. All my days were written in your book and planned before a single one of them began. Formless. This, by the way, refers to all the way back before creation when the earth was formless and void. Before all of that, he knew your name and he knew your days. There's nothing that you can do now to change the length of your days because you're not in control of your days. Sovereign God is in control of your days. And that is good news. That's not bad news. That's good news, really good news. Here's what Charles Quarles said. He's out of Midwestern Seminary. I love this quote. He says, a person's survival depends on God's sovereignty, not human anxiety. What Jesus is saying here is, why are you anxious about your life? Why are you anxious about the number of your days? It's not dependent on that. Your, your number of your days isn't dependent on your anxiety. It's dependent on the Father's plan for you. Then he tells us, don't be worried about our clothing or our necessities. Verse 28, he says, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field. How they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus gives another example here. He gives another illustration here. Instead of talking about birds, he talks about plants and flowers. But I want us to focus in on what he says in the last part of this verse. It's important. He says something to the disciples that seems like a put down. But really when he says this to them, he's telling them the root of their worry. He says, O oh, you of little faith. This phrase, O oh, you of little faith, is used four times in the book of Matthew. It's used when, uh, in chapter 8, verse 26, when the disciples, and by the way, he's speaking to the same disciples here, and he speaks to them in all of these examples. He said the disciples had little faith when they thought Jesus couldn't calm the storm. Remember that? They didn't think he could do it. They had little faith. They had little faith in chapter 14, whenever they, uh, when Peter didn't believe he could walk on the water. When Jesus called him out, he said, I can't do that. And, and he tried and he went underwater and Jesus had to pull him out. He said, oh, you of little faith. Then in chapter 16, the disciples had little faith when Jesus, they believed Jesus couldn't provide bread for them to eat. What are we going to do? How are we going to have food, enough food? Oh, you of little faith. And then this example in chapter six, when they're just worried about their clothes what are we going to wear? Our clothes are wearing out. What are we going to do? Oh, you of little faith. Look at the flowers of the field and the grass. He's given us these examples. Here, here's what uh, little faith is fuel to the fire of worry. When we have little faith, we're going to worry. There's a lot to worry about when there's little faith. When we worry... It points to little faith. We need to find the root of the problem. Here's what uh, Danny Aiken said it this way. He said, at its core, worry is practical atheism. It's practical deism. Or it's practical finite theism. These are big words. And here's what they mean. Atheism says, God isn't there. Isn't that what we do when we worry? We, is he really there? Atheism, practical atheism. 
Deism. Here's what that says. God's there, but he doesn't care. He doesn't care about our problems. You ever feel like that when, when you're worried, you're anxious? Does God really, he's there, but does he really care about me? Does he really care about this? And then finite deism says this, God's there and God cares, but he isn't powerful enough to be counted on. When we're worried and we find ourselves anxious with crippling anxiety, we're saying one of these three things. In a sense, that's what we're saying. We would never say it out loud, but that's what we're saying with the actions of our heart and mind when we worry and when we're anxious. Then Jesus tells us, don't be anxious about tomorrow. Verse 31 says, therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat, what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them all. Well, since worry is practically just not, it's, be, it's having little faith. That's what Jesus says. It's not putting our faith in God. He's comparing the disciples to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are the unbelieving people, the pagans of the day. Now, you and I are, are we're, uh, for non-Jewish people, we're Gentiles. And the gospel has made it to us because of the faithfulness of uh, faithful Christians sharing the gospel, we've had, we have the message of the good news and we're to share it. When Jesus is speaking of the Gentiles, he's saying even the unbelievers, even the pagans, they're the ones who worry about these things. Why are you acting like them? That's the message he's trying to get across that when we are anxious and we worry about these things, we're acting like unbelievers. We're, we're, we have little faith like the unbelievers. We're becoming like those who don't believe and it's a dangerous place to be. The Father, uh, the father knows, it says in this, the last part of that verse that the Father knows you need these things. Here's what Jesus makes very clear here. God will provide everything we need in order for us to fulfill his exact purpose in our lives. For as long as he has our days numbered, he'll provide. That we know. If God has purpose for me on this planet, if he has days left for me on this planet, he has a purpose for me. And with that, I know he'll provide for me. That's what the, that's what the scripture's telling us. Beware the ways of worry. Here's the next thing. Lay aside the weight of worry. How can we lay aside the weight of worry? Why should we lay aside the weight of worry? I'm gonna give you some reasons that we as believers must cling to today. Now I wanna give you, before I give you these reasons, I wanna say this. Christians historically believe uh, God has created the use of science and medicine. Historically, we believe that. It's a good thing. It's a gift of God's common grace to his people. If part of God's plan for your life is you, you're in a situation with anxiety that you need to see a doctor, you need to do what they say, you need to take medicine or whatever it is, do that. Because God's plan for you is to not be anxious. If that's part of the means of getting rid of your anxiety, do that. What I'm gonna say and what Jesus is saying in this passage does not, uh, does not discount the need and use of that. It's his grace that we're able to have it. But here's what I wanna say. That's not for everybody. This is for everybody. At the very least, Christian, we must do what Jesus says. If medicine's part of the plan for you, praise the Lord, but you must do what Jesus says first. Does that make sense? That's, that's, my, that's what I want you to hear me say, because um, I know many, many of you, many believers struggle with anxiety, and I wanna make sure you understand that that can be part of God's plan. First, 
he says, God, uh, we see in the Bible, God's command is clear. His command is clear. Verse 25, the first part of it says, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Let's be clear here when we're looking at this, this is a command. And when we see a command, to not obey that command is a sin. So we have to stop first and we have to call it what it is. We have to look at our worry and our anxiety and we have to look at the words of Jesus and we have to understand, brothers and sisters, to worry is to sin. Jesus is clear on it. And it does cause harm. There are consequences to worry, the consequences to being anxious and uh, it can, it can cause us physical, it can cause us physical, emotional, and psychological harm to worry. We know it's a, it's a terrible thing and it's, it affects a lot of people. I think probably all Christians it's affected. So we need to think of it as Jesus does. Next he says, uh, we see God's care is clear. So God's command is clear. God's care is clear. Verse 32 says, For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. We know this is true, that new troubles and worries will come tomorrow. We know that. Uh, Jerry Bridges, in his book, Trusting God, and by the way, write that down, because I think every Christian needs to get that book and read it, Trusting God by Jerry Bridges. In that book, he gives an illustration that I love. I've used it to, in my life. It's helped me greatly as I've dealt with anxiety and worry. Um, and I've written about it in devotions that you've read probably. I've, I've shared it many times because it's helped me so much. Here's how he compares life um, and worry. He says, life is like a narrow path. And along that path is a thick curtain out in front. And it only lifts up as we progress forward in life. We don't know what's on the other side of the curtain. We don't know what there is to be worried about. Praise the Lord, by the way, that we don't know what's to come. But we still worry about what's to come. A lot of times we worry about things that we ended up not even needing to worry about. But he compares it to that and we don't know what's to come, but here's what we do know is behind the curtain. Accompanying that difficulty or the joy or whatever it is that's to come, accompanying that thing is God's grace and God's mercy. The Bible's clear to us that every day there's new mercy for that day. And with every problem and with everything we face, God's ready right there to shower us with his grace. Anything that's to come, yes, troubles are to come, but anything that's to come, there are two things that will happen. Either he'll deliver you from it quickly or by his grace and accompanied by his mercy, he'll keep you in it as long as his plan deems necessary. You say, well, this, this thing won't pass. This thing just keeps, keeps and keeps nagging me. Trust and rest in the mercy and grace of God, our loving heavenly father, because he will see you through as long as he sees necessary. He is in control, never doubt that. He's in control. Hebrews 4.16, it says, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace in the time of need. And one of the things I love about this verse when it talks about the throne of grace is we approach God's throne with confidence think about thrones. Most thrones are not thrones of grace. So this went against any, any kind of thought the disciples had. Throne of grace. Thrones are usually not grace, graceful. Usually that's a place of condemnation. Not our God. Our God's throne is a throne of grace. And we can, we can boldly come to him because we have the privilege of a relationship with God Almighty, the creator, the king of the universe. Why worry 
we have a relationship with the one who is in control of all these things. Then he says, God, we see God's concern is clear. Verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Okay, here's something that helps me with this. It's helped me so much. Um, and I've had to remind myself of this, even this week, it's a constant battle, right? God's concerned with your concerns, but he isn't worried about your worries. I've had to say this to myself. God's concerned with my concerns, but he isn't worried about my worries. God is not in heaven fidgeting around, worried about, oh no, what, what do I do now? What's gonna happen in this brother or sister's life now? No, he's not worried at all about the things we're worried with. You ever, uh, ever get on an airplane and maybe if you're, especially if you're new to flying and you hit some heavy turbulence, if you're like me, one of the first things I would do when, I, when it was new to me is I would look to the people who fly a lot. I'd look to the, um, the flight attendants. Like, are they, they're not nervous. Okay, then this, this is normal, this is fine. If they, were, if they ran to their chair and buckled up real fast and looked nervous and started breathing heavily, I'd be nervous. <laughs> when we look to God the Father in our worry and anxiety, we don't see a nervous God. We see a God who's on his throne. We see a God who's in control. We can trust him when we look to him. Here's what his concerns are. His, uh, his priorities ought to be our priorities. He says it in this, in this verse. Uh, his concern is, is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God first is concerned is whether or not your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. He's concerned with that. He's not worried about it. That's what, he's think, that's what he's thinking about. That's what he's concerned with. Is your name in the book of life? Righteousness. Are you growing in grace? Are you growing in righteousness? The things that are important. Remember the heavenly treasure. That's what, that's what God's concerned is. He's not worried. He's, that's what his focus is. That should be our focus. That should be our top priority. And God's control is clear. Verse 33 says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. God is sovereign and he can be trusted. When you're in the midst of worry, when you're in the battle of anxiety, remind yourself, God is sovereign and he can be trusted. Sovereignty is bad if the person who has the sovereignty can't be trusted. It's really bad. But in our case, God is the only one who's truly sovereign, who's truly in full control, and he can be completely trusted. He's completely trustworthy. Proverbs 3, 5 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. Think back for a second to a time where you were nervous about something. You were worried sick about something. When I think back on those times, I, I didn't have fun. I did not enjoy it. But when I look back on it now, I think I wouldn't trade that. Because in the midst of that, in that troubled time and that worry, God showered me with his grace in a way that I wouldn't have known before. He showed me his mercy in a way I wouldn't before. Pastor Chris says this all the time. Pastor Michael used to say this all the time. It's gloriously dark. I used to get so aggravated when he would say that to me. <laughs> but he's right, he's right. In the midst of dark times, God is doing a good thing. It's what the book of James teaches us. In dark times, in times where we would worry, God's actually doing something good. Take joy in those trials. As Christians, we have that privilege. We have something that other unbelievers don't have. We can go through really hard things and we can smile. We can have joy in our heart. It doesn't mean that we're just happy and everything's great, but it means our priority, if we look at our priorities, we know that this is in God's hands. And I'm gonna look back at this one day and think, wow, this was a time where God really moved me forward in my walk with him. 
Thank you for taking time to view this message. Notice that I called it a message, not a lesson or a talk, because I pray that as God intended it to communicate to our church, that He's spoken through it into your life as well. Perhaps the most important decision in our lives is what we'll do with the messages that God speaks to us. The Bible says that one of those messages from God relates to His love. John 3 verses 16 and 17 says, For God so loved the world, you could insert your name there, that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. And then it goes on and says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Romans 5 and verse 8 says God didn't leave us just with a verbal witness of that. It says God demonstrates His love toward us. And while we were yet in rebellion and sin against God, Christ died for us. The Bible tells us what we all know somewhat intuitively, that we're here for a purpose and that we rebelled against that created purpose in the choices of our lives. The Bible calls that sin and tells us that we all have this in common. But while that rebellion, that sin, is common, it's not okay with God. In fact, because He's absolutely perfect and righteous, He expects us to be as well since we're created in His image. Now, you recognize the problem. If He expects our perfect righteousness, and we're in fact rebellious sinners, we cannot fulfill our created purpose. This is where the greatest miracle of all time takes place. Before you and I were ever born, God saw our condition and made provision for us to be forgiven and to get a new chance at experiencing God's purpose for our lives. He sent His own and only Son that if we would confess Him as the Lord of our lives, that is the boss, the owner, believing that Christ died on our behalf, being judged in our place for our rebellion, and that having settled this debt of judgment, rose from the dead on the third day, that we might trust in Him with great confidence, we can be saved. In that experience of salvation through our obedient response to Jesus as our Lord, we actually experience a cosmic transfer. It's what theologians call imputed righteousness, meaning Christ's righteousness, His goodness, everything right about Him is actually credited to us. How can we be sure? The Bible says we have to trust this by faith. In other words, we must place our hope in this, truly believing in our hearts that God can do and has done precisely what He claims in His Holy Word. If you've never made this confession, truly made it from your heart, today you could, and we would love to celebrate it with you. My prayer of confession many years ago was quite simple, but it was from the heart. And if you wish, you too could pray to the Lord in this way. A prayer like, God, I know that I'm a rebel and I've sinned. And I believe that Jesus died in my place to settle the debt of judgment for my sin. I'm asking you, Jesus, to forgive my sin, and I'm confessing that you are now the Lord of my life. I choose to follow you for the rest of my life, trusting you with my life forever. Amen. And if you prayed a prayer like that with me, the Bible says that all eternity has changed for you. It'd be my privilege to help you experience the new reality of living as a Jesus follower. If you'll contact us, we'd love to provide you some resources and pray for God's blessing in your new life. Here's the best way to reach us. You can email us at next at inglewoodbaptist.com or by texting the word next to the number 252-888-2227. God bless you, and I hope we'll see you again soon.